the Son of God, and man was dead. With bloody hands, tears on their face, they laid him down inside that Praise the Lord. Aren't you looking forward to that day? I can't wait. It's going to be wonderful. My name's Ken, and I'm so thankful for the privilege to be here today. And if you're a guest with us, you'll notice in the seat in front of you, there's a Connect card. And if you take that out and fill it out for us, you can turn it in the offering box as you leave. You could fill it out with the QR code and uh, take care of that online. But we are so thankful for everybody that's, that's here this morning. If you're tuning in, thank you for being a part of our Easter service. Uh, Resurrection Sunday. And uh, we're just uh, thankful for everyone that's been able to be a part of our, our day today. And as you go out in the lobby, you'll see there's a number of different photo booth opportunities so you can get your Easter Sunday picture with your families and uh, post that, that you were here. And uh, just be so thankful for the privilege to be able to worship together today. And then uh, we wanted to just let you know that there's some exciting things coming up in April. Our uh, summer stage uh, is our kids program that we're doing starting April 7th. And it's going to be a great thing running through the summer. And uh, so if you'd like to volunteer or register, you can use the QR code and uh, also go to our link tree. And then also our next men's uh, up uh, men's conference is coming up on the 19th and 20th of April. And as well on link tree, you can register for that. We just want to see uh, as many men get be a part of that, be encouraged uh, at that event. And then also we have a new sermon series kicking off next weekend uh, called Identity. So be in prayer about what God's going to teach us in that series and uh, be looking forward to uh, all that God's going to bring in this coming month, all right? So let's go to prayer this morning, ask God's blessing on this day and all that He's going to accomplish. Lord, as we come before you, we have uh, already been uh, just thrilled as we've sung about um, your resurrection. And Lord, Friday was a difficult, dark day, but Sunday was coming. And the resurrection is what we're here today to, to just be excited about, to uh, proclaim, uh, Lord, to be uh, just uh, thrilled with the gospel message that we get to celebrate this morning. And so we ask that uh, you would draw people to yourself, uh, whether it be those that haven't come to faith in Christ yet, or that be those that might be just wayward and haven't really been following as closely as they should. We pray that today uh, the work of the gospel uh, the sacrifice that you made so that we could be forgiven uh, and have eternal life. Lord, may that be uh, so powerful in our hearts 
that it would uh, just redirect us to a, a life change that, God, we, we just would never be the same uh, because of you. We praise you for all you're going to do this morning. Bless the word as it goes out. Bless our worship in Jesus' name. Amen.
faithful and he's true. All the way to the end, all the way to death. He's faithful and true. This is Galatians 5, 1. It says, for freedom, Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. We were enslaved to sins, sit to sin. We were enslaved, and because of the cross, because Jesus died a brutal death on a cross and went to hell and conquered death, came back three days later, you and I can be free from sin, from slavery. So let's sing this. For freedom you set me free.
Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the liberty that we find in you. Father, I thank you that through the death and resurrection of your son, we can have eternal life with you, Father. I ask that you would be with Mike as he brings the word. That you would speak through him and to us, Father. We love you and we thank you for all that you do for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Good to see everyone here today. Good to have you. Who's glad to be here? It's a little weak, but for those of you who responded, no. It is good to see you. It really is. I mean, I'm ready to shout and jump up and down and dance a little bit after that last song, right? Exciting, encouraging, freedom we have in Christ is so awesome. Um, if you're a guest with us, my name's Mike. I'm, I get to be a pastor here, Hope Church. It's a great privilege and honor. And, um, we hope you have a good time today. We hope you meet folks from Hope and shake hands. Some, some, someone might hug your neck. It's okay, all right? They're not weirdos. They just love people, all right? But we hope you feel comfortable. And if you're looking for a place to walk out your faith in Jesus, you're a believer, and you want to grow, and you want to be with some people, man, you're welcome. We'd love to have you. You could be part of this church family, and we'll love on you. Someone will treat you enough ways that you'll like one of them. Okay, so, so we'd love to see you come back, but we're glad you're here today. And we're going to talk a little bit about the fact or the question of, is Easter relevant? You know, like it once was. Is it as relevant as it's always been? Does it matter? Does the story of the resurrection of Jesus matter? You know, the same as it did. Now, if, you've, if you followed anything through Holy Week, or it's also called Passion Week, the week leading up to the crucifixion of Jesus Christ, we know some things have happened. Jesus enters Jerusalem triumphantly. People are super happy to see him. They're glad he's there. A big crowd, they're laying palm branches. It's a really cool setting. Um, he does a lot of teaching. He clears the temple of the money changers. He's like, dudes, you got it wrong, and he throws them out. He, uh, he's betrayed by Judas. First time we see money over Jesus, right, face to face. Judas goes, I'll take the 30 pieces of silver. I don't want Jesus. I want the money. Um, he's arrested, beaten mercilessly to the point the Bible says you couldn't tell what man he was after he, they were done beating him. Couldn't recognize him. And then he was hung, crucified on a cross, which was Friday morning. Well, I hope by the time we're done today that you see that that. Resurrection Sunday and Easter Sunday matters. We're going to look at the dark time that the followers of Christ were experiencing after his uh, crucifixion. And I, I want to say this, that there are times most of us are old enough in this room, except for the youngsters, we have some of the youngsters, where we've been through a time that we would describe as dark. And what I mean by dark is that you're not sure what's happening in your life. You're not sure why some of the things happening around you that are impacting you or affecting you, why they're happening. Right? You're struggling with where God is. Is there God? You look, if you think there is a God, believe there's a God, you go, why are you letting this happen to me? Do you care that this is happening to me? Right? You don't have to raise your hand, but I know there are people in this room that have been to that kind of level before. You say, man, it's just, I would just describe it as a dark place in my life, a dark time in my life struggling to see what's right and what's wrong, what's coming ahead, how something that I'm looking at is going to end. Like I see it happening, but how's it going to play out? I'm just not sure. Could be health situations. Could be family job situations. You name it. And if you're honest about it, when you share with a close friend or family member, you've said, I'm in a dark place before. Something similar to that. You've described it that way. Look at Matthew 27. It says that from the sixth hour, there was darkness over all the land until the ninth hour. This is when Jesus is on the cross. And it's the sec, it's really, we know it to be noon till 3 p.m. For those three hours, it's completely dark. Okay? 
the truth is that there's no human physical explanation for this happening. Right here we see it, and then also in Matthew, I mean in Mark, they say it, there was darkness. That's how they describe this three-hour time. There was darkness. Luke says that the sun's light faded. In the Greek, the actual original language, the word is eklepo, which is where we get the word eclipse, which we get to experience, Lord willing, on next Monday, the 8th. Unless it's cloudy, then it's just another day, right? No, I think you'll still see some effects of it. But if it's a bright and sunny day, we're going to get to experience something pretty cool. Now, eclipses happen every 18 months on the planet. But you getting to be in a place where it comes across your house, if you will, like right over the top of your house, is about every 1,900 years. So it's not normal. It's not something you say, yeah, I saw that last year. That's not how this works. This is pretty cool. But that wasn't what was going on. Some people trust, well, it's probably just an eclipse. We see those. That's what happened. No. It was the first of the month. It was Passover. It's a full moon. You don't have eclipse then. The moon and sun are opposite. There's no human physical explanation other than the fact that God decided to give three hours of darkness supernaturally. There are Roman historians, Phlegon and Tertullian, they actually wrote about this strange darkness that came over the earth. There's a report called the Report of Pilate to Tiberius, the Caesar at the time. And in the report, it notes that the emperor was aware that in the world on a certain day from noon to three, everyone had to light a lamp because it was dark everywhere. So it's not just God saying it in the Bible. I mean, even outside the Bible, historians have said, yeah, there was this weird thing that happened for three hours. God just turned the lights out. And it's not the first time he's done things like this. Joshua 10 says the sun stood, stood still. 2 Kings 20 says the sun on the dial moved backward. Time moved backward. And then we know in Exodus 10, the plagues of darkness that swept across Egypt. So if you go through biblical history, does God have the power to make it dark or light? He's exercised that. And if you believe he's creator God, guess what? He can do whatever he wants. So he's supernatural. That's what happened here. So then the question becomes why? Why did he do it? We really don't know. People say maybe God was throwing a veil over his son's suffering. Maybe he was, uh, it was a divine act of sympathy because God was mourning and tearful and in a dark place himself, seeing what's going on with his son. Maybe it was a divine protest. I, I know this needs to happen, but I hate you guys for doing it. I'm mad at you guys for doing this to my son. These are things people have speculated. We do not really know, but we know this. In the Bible, darkness is usually associate, associated with judgment. And the judgment of all the sins of mankind at that moment are on the shoulders of Jesus. He's wearing all of God's wrath and judgment for us. So it seems fitting that he would go three hours of darkness. So that's physically, it really got dark for three hours. That's a real thing. If you were alive, you would see that. Spiritually, that darkness moved its way into the heart and the spirit of the disciples, the followers of Jesus. They got into what we would say was a pretty dark place in their life. Right after the crucifixion of Jesus, this is exactly how they would have probably described the times. I don't know how to explain it. It's just... I'm overcome with doom. I'm overcome with gloom and darkness. As you know, there were a lot of people at that point that Jesus died that said, see, I told you he wasn't who he said he was. Can you imagine all the other people pointing at the followers and Jesus said, I told you guys were idiots, you fools. He's just a man. Look what you've done. There's nothing special about him. He died like the rest of us, those who have, and the rest of us will. He's just a dude. Matthew 27, verse 62 says that the next day, after he died on the cross, after the preparation of the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered before Pilate, and they said, Sir, we remember how that imposter, referring to Jesus, he said this while he was still alive, After three days I will rise. So he's nothing miraculous. He's nothing special. Maybe he was a good teacher. 
Maybe he was nice to people. He fed some people and did some cool things, but he's an imposter. He wasn't the real deal. So what do we need to do? Verse 64, order that the tomb be made secure until the third day. Let his disciples go and steal him away, lest his disciples go and steal him away and tell all the people, see, he's risen from the dead. And the last fraud, this that would happen now, will be made, will be worse than the first. If they take his body and say, see, I told you he rose again, that's going to be a worse problem for us than the first problem when he was walking around teaching and doing miracles. So Pilate said to them, you have, guard, you have a guard of soldiers. Go make it as secure as you can. So they went and made the tomb secure by sealing the stone and setting a guard. They needed to have a plan in place to explain what might happen. You see, isn't that interesting? That you, we're going to look at the disciples in the dark place they are, and these guards are thinking, bro, something might happen. They might steal the body or something else, but we need to seal this thing and guard it. This man wasn't maybe just normal. We call him an imposter and, and fraud, but we've got to guard this thing, man. They're serious about it. And at this very moment, it's probably the bleakest, the darkest of all time on earth for people who are following Jesus. After Jesus was crucified, the apostles were afraid. They were very frightened about a few things. Number one, what was going to happen to them? Okay, people have seen us following Jesus. They know us. And now that he's dead and was nothing special, apparently, what's going to happen to us? I don't know what's going to happen to me. The man that they saw as God's son the Son of God is dead. They're frightened. They don't know what to do. It appeared all hope was lost. They probably thought that he would, Jesus was going to raise an army for them and we we're, going to, we we're going to do this thing. And instead, he died on the cross. They asked him several times, are you going to bring an army? So the truth is this, that when Jesus died, hope died. On that Friday, when his life ebbed from his body and there was no more breathing and no more fighting for breath, hope died. Andy Stanley says this about this particular period in time. Popular author, writer, pastor, he said this, there were no Christians then because there was no Christ. At this time in history, there were no Christians because there was no Christ. I don't believe that there were none. I think Andy is... Uh, being hyperbolic. I think he's exaggerating a bit to get a point across. I don't believe every person that walked with Jesus and believed he was the son of God simply said, oh, that's it. He wasn't real. I don't believe that. I believe a lot of them did. I believe a lot of them got really, really close, but I don't believe that there were no believers left that didn't believe in three days. I'm waiting at least till three days to see if he's coming back. I'm not going to say it now, but many of them were afraid and started to struggle, struggle. Many were, were in that boat of <laughs> it's all lost, it's all over. Look at Mark 16. It says that when the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome bought spices so that they might go and anoint him. Very early on the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb. And they were saying to one another on the way, who's going to roll away the stone for us from the entrance of the tomb? They saw the big stone. It took several guards to roll it and get in place. Who's going to move that for us? Sometimes when this story is told, we think Mary and them are going to go, hey, let's go see if Jesus rose again. Remember what he told us? Let's go check it out. That is not what's in their hearts, not what's in their mind. They went and bought spices to what? Anoint his dead body. And they just needed help moving the stone. That's all that's going on right here with them. John 20, they, they're talking to Peter. Mary Magdalene's talking to Peter. says, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb and we do not know where they have laid him. They don't know what happened. There's no, guys, do you think it's possible? He really rose from the dead? Could he have really done it? That's not what this, what's going on. They said, they took him. We don't know where he is. Even in Mark 16, when Jesus has appeared to the ladies, they say in verse 10, she went and told those who had been with him, his closest disciples, as they mourned and wept because they're fearful, they went back to the upper room, many of them, and they just cloistered together because why? They're afraid. 
And she went and told them. But when they heard that he was alive and had been seen by her, they would not believe it. So this is the picture of this time frame. His closest followers, those who saw him perform miracles, helped him perform miracles, helped him serve people, saw people's lives changed. None of those people had a plan to carry on the dream and to carry on the movement. They didn't even believe it when she says, Jesus just appeared to me. I saw him. We didn't know where he was because the tomb was empty, but now I've seen him and they don't believe. They're really close to the Jesus simply wasn't who he claimed to be. Very close to that point. I want you to know about the disciples, why they followed Jesus. The disciples did not follow Jesus because of his miracles. They also didn't follow him because of his friendship or his excitement, his riz that was all, of, all the buzz, right? He, that's not why. He also, they didn't also follow him because of his teaching. Here's the truth about most of Jesus' teaching. They didn't understand it. Very many times he would teach and look at them in the eye that he loved them, they loved him, and they didn't understand what he was telling them when he talked. Very, a lot of times he has, uh, Jesus, thanks for that lesson. Could you now explain it to us? Other times the teaching was too hard. So you know when you start teaching somebody something, if you start with a little kid teaching them to read and write, you start with A, B, C, right? You start with letters. Then you graduate to words, cat, dog, mom, dad. Then sentences, right? And if your kid's really smart, one day they learn how to write paragraphs. No, I'm just kidding. We all get there. but You, you progress, correct? You don't just stay with the A's and B's. You progress. It gets harder. It gets a little more difficult. Jesus' teaching was the same. He taught them simple things, and then as they grew, he got deep with them about some things. And look what it says in John 6. When many of his disciples heard it, Jesus is teaching a little more advanced, a little deeper. They said, this is a hard saying. Who can listen to it? After this, many of his disciples turned back and no longer walked with him. You're talking about things now that make me not want to follow you. I don't want to go where you're leading us. It's going to be hard to follow you and hear you teach all this and do what you're saying. Well, listen, if anybody ever told you it was easy to follow Jesus in the world we live in, they lied. It is difficult. Jesus said in this world, you will have trouble, right? But he says, take heart, I've overcome the world. But it's not going to be easy to live in a world that fights against everything Jesus believes and stands for and try to live like Jesus. So at this point, it gets too hard for these guys, and they bail. These are this is a big group of, of followers, probably somewhere between 70 to 150 people that are following, and they're supposedly devoted to him until he teaches some of the harder things. They're like, forget it. No, thank you. So Jesus, verse 27, turned to the 12 and says, do you guys want to leave as well? A lot of our crowd is walking away. Do you see them? The, the disciples saw this. They're like, holy cow, now it's just us again. There were many, now there are 12. So Jesus kind of gives them an out. Listen, guys, this is a perfect time to bail if you want to. He's not saying all that, but he's asking them, do you also want to leave? If you leave now, it's, it's not as bad because you're just going to leave with everybody else. You're just going to be part of the crowd. They're not going to pinpoint and say, oh, I thought you were a real follower. You just go with the whole crowd here. Look what, look what Simon Peter says in verse 68. He answered the Lord. He said, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. And we have believed and, listen, have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. Do you know why the disciples kept following Jesus? Because they believed he was the Son of God. Not his teachings, not his miracles, not his friendship, none of those things. It's because they truly believed. Those that stood faithful kept falling close to Jesus. But when he died, that fervor to follow and that hope that they had died as well. And if it wasn't dead, it was on life support, in the hospital, 
It's not the normal rhythms. It's that just line that every once in a while beats. If you've ever been with a loved one at the end of their life, it's not fun. But you see that and you see life actually ebbing out of them. You could easily see, looking at this, that it's a dark time in their life. They changed their lives three years ago to follow him because he's the Son of God, the Messiah, the Savior, and now he's dead. This is how dark it is. But then something happened. Something happened that changed the world. This thing that happened, it it changed everything. If you've ever thought that we, that you know about Jesus, you know about Christianity, you know about salvation because of the Bible, I want to tell you that's not actually accurate. I want to tell you, just share a little bit about this, how it is actually, how it came to to be. This event that we're talking about today and celebrating today, the event where something happened, the resurrection of Jesus Christ, is the event that started it all. It's the event that changed the world. This event, his resurrection, led to the movement Christianity, which eventually got us the Bible, right? I love the Bible. I know many of you love the Bible. It is the source of hope. It is how I commune with God. I pray. I cry out to him at times when I'm in a dark place, right? I speak in the Holy Spirit. The Bible says illuminates the scriptures to me to help me grow and to help me see where I need to be more like Jesus. I love the word of God. But it didn't start the movement of Christianity. The resurrection did. The resurrection is what started it. The Bible was not compiled and put together and all the stories written down for some 350 years. So what do you know that can last for 350 years with no one saying anything about it until the Bible's complete? Oh, here's the book of what happened 350 years ago. Books don't typically last. Very few books, we said this a few weeks ago, last past 100 years. They're hard to find. They're they're not in print anymore. They're just, so 350 years later, now we can find, what happened again back then? There was a hill, what was it called? Calgary, Calvary, Golgotha. I need to read, 350 years, that would have been dreadful for the movement. The resurrection of Jesus Christ started Christianity. These disciples, many who ended up having their writings put into the Bible, included in the Bible, they went around telling everybody who would listen that Jesus is alive. Yes, I understand. I saw him die as well. He's alive, though. He said he would resurrect, and he did. And Jesus appeared to some 600, 700 people that saw him after his resurrection. And the disciples who believed their hope that was like on life support is back. Their lungs are full of air. They are telling every person who will listen, bro, he's alive like he said he would be. Three days later, he's alive. We've met him. We've seen him. And for 30 years, Peter has been, after this point, telling anybody who would listen. He'd go to villages, and the people in the village would come out to him and say, come eat with us in our house. Tell me what you saw. I want to hear from you. Tell us. Come be with my family. My family. Other families coming. My neighbors are coming. Tell us the story of the resurrection for 30 years. And for several years, towards the end, Mark is with him. Mark travels with him, helps him, is an interpreter, and he's taking notes. Anybody seen that? You've seen The Chosen? You paid attention to how Matthew is taking notes all the time. That's how he ends up putting together the book of Matthew. Okay, so Mark's doing the same thing. Well, Peter gets to Rome, and it's Nero's Rome. He's the leader at the time, and he gets arrested and put in jail. And this is around the time that Mark spends a great deal of time with him. And I want you to picture, if you will, Mark saying, yes, yeah, keep talking and I'm writing down, bro. But when Peter gets to the story of the resurrection, I can imagine Mark saying, 
slow your roll for a minute. Slow down. I want every word to be right about what happened on this special morning. And this is part of those words, Mark 15, verse 42. Peter told Mark, Mark wrote down, when evening had come, since it was the day of preparation, that is the day of before the Sabbath, Joseph of Arimathea, who's a respected member of the council, who was also himself looking for the kingdom of God, seeking, he took courage and he went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Pilate was surprised to hear that, that he should have been dead already, already, been, already died, and summoning the centurion, he asked him whether he was already dead. The centurion, when he learned from the centurion that he was dead, he granted the corpse to Joseph, which is very, very rare. It just doesn't happen, but he did. And Joseph bought a linen shroud and taking him down, wrapped him in the linen shroud, laid him in a tomb that had been cut out of the rock, and he rolled a stone against the entrance of the tomb. Now it says Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Joseph, saw where he was laid. It's important because why? They want to go and take the spices that they bought, and they want to anoint the body. Here's the reason they wanted to anoint. Because the body starts to smell after a number of days, and the Jews didn't believe in embalming. So they wanted to honor the body of Christ by using the spices on his body. That's the purpose. That's why they go, Mark 1, 16 says, so that they might go and anoint him. That's the main reason the body was, was the spices were taken. You remember when Lazarus, Jesus came and Lazarus was in the tomb and they said, he, Jesus said, move the stone. And he starts to say, Lazarus, come forth. And they say, oh, Jesus, he already stinks by now because it's been four days. So that's the issue. That's why they bought the spices and wanted to anoint him. Well, look at verse four. It says, looking up as they they're go to, to uh, anoint his body, they saw that the stone had been rolled back and it was very large took a lot of people to put the stone in place, and now it's rolled back. Entering the tomb, they saw a young man sitting on the right side, dressed in a white robe, and they were alarmed. He said to them, don't be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, who is crucified. He has risen. He is not, he is not here. You can see the place where he laid, but then what? Go tell his disciples and Peter that he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him, what? Just as he told you. I'm glad the angel wasn't sarcastic because he'd say, like you've clearly forgotten, he told you he was going to rise again and see you in Galilee. But he didn't do that because he's nice, angel. So they went out and fled from the tomb, for trembling and astonishment had seized them, and they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. They believed, but they just saw an angel talk to them, so... They're a little freaked out. Now, if you are in the room or watching online and you are a follower of Jesus right now, you would say that you heard the gospel at some point in your past. You believe that God loves you so much he sent his son Jesus. You believe that Jesus was the son of God, died to pay the penalty for your sins and mine and for the sins of the whole world, and you put your faith and trust in Jesus. If that's you right now, I imagine that if you were to talk to Peter or Andrew or John or James, that they would want to say to you, your faith, your sacrifice, your compassion, your generosity, your loyalty, your love, your hope, none of it was in vain because we saw him alive. All of that that you have in you because of being a follower of Jesus is warranted because Jesus is alive. That's what they would tell us today. John's going to come up and get ready to play, and I want to say that if you're here today and watching and you're not convinced, you say, Mike, I've been a lot of Easter services, and I still i am not convinced. I've heard you preach today, and guess what? I'm still not convinced. I want to say to you that if one of the disciples, one of the close followers of Jesus be it one of the men or women, if they could sit next to you and get lean in real close, look, they would say to you, I understand how you feel. They would say, look, I was also almost unconvinced. I almost lost my faith because I watched from the back of the crowd and I saw him die. 
So this doubt that you have and you're not ready to believe, I, I get that feeling. But they would say to you as they lean in closer, but then something happened. And that something that happened changed my life. And from that point on, it's caused me to spend the rest of my life risking my life so that you and everyone else could know that Jesus is alive. That he's real. That he is the son of God. That he did die on the cross and raise three days later, conquering sin and death, purchasing your forgiveness of all of your sins. This resurrection, this something that happened, changed the world and started it all. That's why Mark tells us in his first chapter, verse 15, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. So because of that, repent and believe in the gospel of Jesus Christ, the good news. Peter would tell you that God has done something for you because God is for you. And he simply wants you to receive this good news of Jesus and accept his invitation to follow him. Jesus' resurrection, his coming back from life, coming back to life after he died to pay the penalty for your sins and mine. We said it already. It changed the world then. And if you're not a believer, it can change your world now, starting today. I'm going to ask you to stand for just a minute. At Hope Church, we call this response time, reflection time. And what we want to give you the opportunity to do is to reflect on the things that have been said from the Word of God and what those mean to you. Because every one of us is different. Every one of us is going through different things. Every one of us has different needs in our life at this time. And the Word of God speaks to you where you are. What you're going through is different than what I'm going through and the person next to you. So we want you to reflect on these truths that we've shared. If you're already a, a Christian, the question for you today is, are you in a dark place? Do you find yourself today in kind of a dark place like the disciples did? You have worries, doubts, you're wrestling with things, you're struggling. If that's the case, I want to remind you that you can rest and you can have confidence in the Lord Jesus Christ. You are not going through whatever you're going through alone. Jesus is with you. He said he, he would never leave you nor forsake you. He's not going to turn his back on you because, you're like, oh, you're doing that? That's not Jesus. He's not going to judge you in that. He's going to love you in that and help you through it. So rest in that. And then also, how often are you going about like the disciples when they learned Jesus had really risen from the dead? How often are you telling other people about that truth? Christianity launched and sparked and started because Jesus came back to life. You're able to try to follow Jesus because Jesus came back to life. How often are you telling other people that? That's my question for you, if you're a believer. And then again, finally, if you're in the room or watching online and you, you would say to me, Mike, I'm not a Christian. I'm not a follower of Jesus Christ. I don't know that I believe all of that. I want you to know a few things that the Bible tells us. God loves you. God is for you. Jesus loves you. Jesus is for you. Jesus died to pay the penalty for your sins just like mine and for the sins of the whole world. You know what that means? You can have forgiveness for free right now. Anything in your past, anything you're currently doing that you know according to the Bible, the Bible calls sin. You say, Mike, you don't know what I'm doing. You don't know what's in my life and my past. I'm, I'm glad I don't know, but I also do not care because neither does God. 
you're not going to be, you say, if I open up the books on my past, God's going to go, no, not this one. That's not how it works. You are unconditionally, faithfully loved by God, creator God of the universe, who sent his only son for you. You know what he wants you to do? Believe in that. Receive your forgiveness and become his child. Having a heavenly father that will never leave you nor forsake you and a savior that will go with you through life. It's yours today. You can put your faith and trust in God. So I'm going to pray here in just a minute, but before I do, I want to ask you to bow your heads because if you're here and you need to pray with someone, we're going to have men and lady right here on the front, men and ladies that will pray with you if you're in one of those dark places and you just want to pray, if you're a believer. But if you're not a believer and you say, I'd like to know more about following Jesus Christ, they will help you. They will pray with you. They will show you what the next steps look like. They will show you how to put your faith and trust in Jesus and begin your faith journey. And there's nothing we want more than to see you touched by the truth of Jesus Christ today and your life following him start. So I'm going to pray, and as the instruments play after that, you're more than welcome. Walk right up here and grab one of these guys. They will pray with you. Father, we're thankful for your truth today. We're thankful for a special day to celebrate and maybe wear a new shirt or a new dress. That's exciting. But God, mostly it's because we're thankful for what you did with Jesus for us. God, that you sent him, your only son, to die for us. And he didn't die in vain. He rose again so that we could know how much you love us. God, thank you so much for the truth of the resurrection. Thank you that we can be a church full of people that love one another and walk through this life together. Thank you, God, for the opportunity for some to hear again your gospel. God, we don't want your words, the words from your word that we shared today and we sang today, we don't want those to go. uh, We want them to fall on ears and hearts that you're working in. So God, do your work through your Holy Spirit. We ask you to do that now. We'll give you the honor and glory for it in Jesus' name. Amen.
precious blood that my Jesus spilled. Now the curse of sin has no hold on me. Whom the sun sets free, oh, it's free. thank you that the stone was rolled away, Father. Thank you for raising from the dead so that we can live with you forever, Father. Thank you for your mercy and grace. Even though I messed up, and though we mess up, that through Jesus Christ we can live forever, Father. We love you and thank you for all that you do for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Y'all dismissed. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord.